In this lecture, we'll be looking at a period of uh, the history of Mexico known as the Porfiriato, which ran from approximately 1876 to 1910, the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. The ascension to power of Porfirio Diaz, who is pictured on this slide, in 1877 begins a lengthy period of the history of Mexico that we call the Porfiriato, which is a play on his uh, first name. As we examine the era, keep in mind the following themes. Uh, there was a significant economic transformation of Mexico between the years of 1876 and 1910. Um, political life in the Porfiriato differed in many ways from the instability of the previous six decades since Mexican independence. The philosophy known as positivism influenced the generation of leaders known as the Cientificos during the Porfiriato. And finally, keep in mind the factors that may have contributed to the eventual downfall of Diaz. We will explore these further when we move on to the segment regarding the Mexican Revolution. Porfirio Diaz was a mestizo with a Native American mother and a father of Spanish descent. However, Diaz was somewhat self-conscious of his Native American ancestry, and he deliberately embraced European culture and values. As a young man, Diaz uh, studied for the priesthood, but the eruption of war with the U.S. in 1846 caused him to rethink his career options. He spent a number of years in the Mexican military, and he gained fame in the war against uh, French intervention during the ill-fated reign of Emperor Maximilian I. Now, by the end of the war with the French in 1867, Diaz was a general in the army. The image on this slide is of Porfirio Diaz in 1867. Um, in 1876, he drafted something known as the Plan of Tuxtepec. The Plan of Tuxtepec was essentially a military coup d'etat. Uh, it ousted President Sebastián Lerdo de Tejada, who was president of Mexico from 1872 to 76. Lerdo is depicted on this slide. Uh, the final battle of Tecuac was a military confrontation between forces loyal to Lerdo and Diaz. Diaz came out on top, and after a period, a very short period of consolidation, uh, Diaz appointed himself as president uh, May 5th of 1877. In a number of ways, Mexico in 1876 was economically and socially and intellectually somewhat backward as compared at least with Western industrial nations such as the United States and Great Britain. In part this was due to the many wars and political chaos of the preceding decades, but in part this also reflected the values of the traditional Mexican elites who were uninterested in change because frankly they had it good. The six decades since Mexican independence had been quite unstable with foreign invasions, civil wars, and frequent coup d'etats being hatched. Um, between 1810 and 1876, for example, the presidency changed hands 76 times in 66 years. The government at this time was essentially broke by 1876 with expenditures far outseating, far exceeding, excuse me, revenues. Mexico had enormous foreign debts and very adverse balance of payments problems with imports far exceeding exports and then the resultant exodus of capital from the country to pay for those imports. Worse still, foreign financiers were very fearful of investing their capital in the Mexican economy with good reason. Uh, the Hacendados, which we'll talk about in a few slides, were a group of wealthy landowners who were reluctant to change. They had power, control, and money. And uh, with regards to literacy, the image on this slide is of, of a public letter writer who is a literate person who composed material for others for a small fee. And literacy was certainly a problem that uh, Mexico faced and didn't really come to terms with during the period of the Porfiriato. The Porfiriato, as mentioned, was an, area, an era of rapid growth, and the economic growth of the period was squarely centered on commodity exports. A reinvigorated mining sector returned its uh, production to the peaks of the colonial era uh, by the 1870s. Uh, there was also a rise in export agriculture with commodities such as cattle, 
Hennequin, coffee, and sugar becoming major exports. However, during the Porfiriato, Mexico became heavily reliant upon the U.S. economy, which was the outlet for about three-fourths of Mexico's exports. Pictured on this slide is an image of the port of Veracruz and the Gulf of Mexico in 1908. Hennequin is a plant in the agave family, and the plant became an important cash crop during the Porfiriato. Other types of agave are used for tequila, but the leaves of this particular um, agave plant, the Hennequin plant, are used to produce a fiber from which rope is made. Um, fiber is extracted by smashing the Hennequin leaves with a uh, rotating wheel with uh, sort of dulled cutting blades. Originally, haciendas were land grants made by the Spanish monarch to individuals who had performed service for them. Most of the original haciendas were granted to conquistadors. An hacendado, the word you see pictured here, is the proprietor or the owner of the hacienda. During the Porfiriato, hacendados benefited from changes in property laws and from their political and financial connections to the regime. In particular, land laws were passed during the Porfiriato stating that any land without a title immediately defaulted to the government. Um, most peasants at the time were illiterate and they didn't possess these paper deeds. They only knew that you know, they had lived on the land all their lives, that their fathers and grandfathers had farmed that land, and that the land had been in their families for many generations. Um, so they would lose land in this uh, kind of land grab in the 1880s, 90s, and early 1900s. Even peasants who still somehow possessed paper deeds from the 16th century were often duped by land speculators who told them the old deeds were worthless because they may not have been signed right or didn't have the right seal, and that they should sell the land for a tiny fraction of the true value. This would be better than nothing, at least according to the real estate swindlers traveling the countryside. I should also mention that uh, the land system was based on something called the Ejido system, E-J-I-D-O. Um, so it was sort of a communal land system in which uh, the village played the important role, and village elders or patriarchs made major decisions. You couldn't sort of buy and sell your land if you were a peasant, um, stick a for sale out, sign out in front of it. Um, it, was a, it was community property in a, in a much different way than the Western European, emerging Western European tradition of private property. Um, as a result of these land sharks um, roaming the countryside, a few hundred Asandado families controlled roughly half the land in Mexico by 1910. Millions of Mexicans no longer had use of their ancestral lands. Now, the Porfiriado was not the first time in Mexican history in which um, ejidos or peasants were losing lands, but this process um, just... Uh, exponentially ramped up in this time period during the 1880s moving forward. This slide has a photograph of a massive hacienda near Mexico City in 1907. This particular hacienda specialized in production of a specific species of agave plant used in the manufacture of pulque, P-U-L-Q-U-E, which is a fermented alcoholic beverage. I tried it once. It's not very good. I'll save you the hassle, but uh, if you're in Mexico City, you know, go go try it sometime. But I'm, you'll probably be disappointed if you have sort of, you know, a mainstream American taste. It's just kind of viscousy and, and unpleasant. I didn't like it. Anyways, this hacienda was over uh, 300,000 acres in size. Some hacendados during the Porfiriato controlled millions of acres in land, either directly or through holdings of family members. By contrast, the largest uh, comparable property in the U.S. at the time was the legendary King Ranch in Texas, which had about 300,000 acres in the 1880s. So some of these hacendados had holdings eight to ten times greater than the largest comparable uh, ranch in the United States. The King Ranch today is in the millions of acres. Um, it's more like a giant corporation than anything else. It covers like parts of six counties of Texas. Um, many hacendados were also heavily invested in uh, manufacturing, transportation, export, mining, and banking industries as well. Very diversified. <laughs>
This image is a photograph of the mansion of a wealthy Mexican family in 1901. If you look closely enough, you can see many architectural elements that are French in origin. Many hacendados and other Mexican elites highly valued French culture and French art. The word peones uh, re refers to the rural peasants living on the haciendas who made up the vast majority of the population of Mexico during the Porfiriato. Uh, the word has origins meaning like forced laborer dating back to medieval Europe. The lives of peones in Mexico uh, in many ways differed very little from slavery. Most peones were not paid in money, but in a form of scrip that could only be exchanged at a store owned by the hacendado. These stores would charge prices much, much higher than uh, normal retail prices for the time. They would also charge high rates of interest on any balances owned by the peones. And the peones quickly found themselves um, in significant debt. Mexico had um, strict laws preventing peones with any debt, even a single peso, from leaving the hacienda on which they worked. Even worse, uh, debt could not be discharged at any point in your life. They didn't have bankruptcy court. Uh, debts from a deceased peone, this is the worst part, would uh, still be owed by the children of the dead peone, resulting in many uh, families with many generations of debt. And in many ways, I think this, uh, this system, there's a lot of similarities to the feudal structures in uh, medieval Europe in terms of uh, their effect on, uh, on politics and the economy and the lives of peasants. One scholar has termed the Porfiriato as an era of growth without equity, meaning that there was a booming economy but there was also a uh, sort of a lack of sustained national wealth and the most Mexicans did not benefit from the growth and in many cases they were harmed by the growth. Under the railroad policies enacted in the Porfiriato, millions of acres of land were given away to developers in exchange for construction. Again, some of the same sort of, I, I have to use the word swindles, where people who had, uh, peasants who lived on land for many generations were um, forced off their land because they just lacked a piece of paper saying that they had the title to it. Foreign capital invested in Mexican industries and agricultural operations did produce um, economic growth, but it also resulted in profits that were, you know, siphoned off or shipped overseas almost immediately. And then the emphasis on export agriculture contributed to a decline in food supply, domestic food supply, as well as significant increases in food prices at a time of rapid population growth. During the Porfiriato, the population of Mexico essentially doubled and uh, uh, the domestic agricultural sector did not by any stretch keep up with the demand for, um, for foodstuffs by average Mexican citizens. Um, the gap between the rich and the poor widened tremendously during the Porfiriato. Um, in short, economic growth during the Porfiriato primarily benefited foreign investors and uh, just a handful of uh, wealthy Mexican elites. Most people did not benefit from the Porfiriato. The Cientificos were a group of technocratic advisors to Diaz who helped carry out his program of modernization and economic growth. The word is related to the Spanish word for scientist. And the Cientificos also reflects the influence of French philosopher Auguste Comte, who argued that Western society was entering an age when scientific inquiry would solve most human problems. Most Cientificos believed that Mexico had to pass through a phase they called administrative power uh, before democracy and freedom could be permitted. I think most 21st century observers would probably consider the term administrative power to simply be a nice way of saying a dictatorship. Most Cientificos had very negative views regarding Indians, indigenous peoples, believing them to be either biologically or uh, socially destined to be somewhat inferior to the Criollos, who were uh, whites of European ancestry born in Mexico. So again, there's a sort of quasi-racist um, skin color based divide in Mexico that's happening as well. It's not as clear cut, for example, as uh, you know, the black white divide in the United States after the Civil War and up to the 
civil rights era of the 1960s, but it's still there and it's still still significant. And it wouldn't be till the 1920s that there was a sort of vigorous um, effort to be more inclusive for political reasons. Pictured on this slide is Jose Yves Limantour, the chief architect of the economic and financial policies of Diaz. His last name is spelled L-I-M-A-N-T-O-U-R. This chart demonstrates the substantial economic growth during the Porfiriato. You don't have to know these numbers, just be kind of familiar with the fact that uh, Mexico's economy did grow significantly. Uh, Mexican GDP growth was on par with that of the U.S. from 1870 to 1910, and the gross domestic product uh, doubled in that 40-year span. But again, it was a, a handful of people that benefited directly, and most folks either didn't benefit or had negative consequences as a result of this growth. The green shaded areas on this map are the major mining regions that were exploited during the Porfiriato for export commodities. Iron, uh, copper, and coal were among the most significant of these mining exports. Um, there was some silver and gold mined that tended not to be sent out for export, but rather kept in the country. Um, during the Porfiriato, there was also a railroad construction boom that I hinted at earlier. From a few hundred miles of poorly coordinated lines in 1870, Mexico saw over 15,000 miles of rail lines by 1910. Um, however, the rail lines were not really there for public transportation so much as uh, they tended to be built in conjunction with exports. You can note from this map that many rail lines were situated in a way to facilitate the export of raw materials to port cities and to the United States. In 1876, Diaz campaigned with the following slogan, Suffragio Efectivo, No Reelección, or Effective Suffrage, No Reelection. This was a dig at Lerdo. Um, he did keep this promise, and he sat out the 1880 election, although he handpicked his successor, Manuel Gonzalez, one of his trusted political operatives. The idea behind this original slogan was that uh, Diaz represented something different. He wasn't a sort of career politician. Does this sound familiar? We've got this term limit debates in the United States in, uh, in the, uh, the present day. However, after he was uh, elected as president again in 1884, Diaz worked to eliminate all electoral limits from the Mexican Constitution. And uh, political opponents changed the earlier slogan to uh, Sufragio Efectivo No Reelección, or um, No Effective Suffrage and Reelection. So it was a sort of a wry commentary because um, uh, this was an era in which um, the Porfiriato, that is, in which Diaz uh, seemed to be working mostly for his own re-election and his own power. And while there was uh, um, significant corruption in the Porfiriato, it doesn't seem that the Diaz personally benefited in any significant illegal ways. He was really about the power and or the vision of Mexico that he had. Uh, the Porfiriato was also noted for being an era of uh, significant government repression. Journalists who uh, dared to write critical pieces about the regime found themselves harassed or jailed or even occasionally murdered in an effort to repress dissent. And it only takes a couple of dead journalists to uh, make people not want to uh, write critical things of the government. Elections were largely a farce in Mexico, with massive vote fraud, uh, bribery, and voter intimidation used to keep Diaz in power. Uh, the court system was one of the most egregious examples of the rampant corruption in the Mexican government, and the idea that you could get justice was, uh, was almost laughable, laughable because the idea was to buy justice in Mexico during this time. This image is of the Mexican Rurales. The Rurales was the name used for the Mexican Rural Guard, which was a police force in the countryside that existed between 1861 and 1914. Initially, Diaz sought to use the Rurales to eliminate bandits in some rural areas, but his regime increasingly used force as a means of both perpetuating itself and to stifle dissent. They became almost... Uh, maybe state 
state-sponsored terror is a bit too strong, but they were definitely used for intimidation. Um, while the rallies did have some effect at restoring law and order in the countryside, uh, they were more used as a check against uh, army um, officials and officers uh, from having any ideas of, uh, of overthrowing his regime, and also, again, to intimidate opponents, uh, intimidate opponents and to um, uh, put down any rebellions that did pop up. This brings to a close our brief look at the Porfiriato.